Today's topic is cloning, gene therapy, and complex human traits. And you'll see how they're all related in a second. Um, we're going to go through a few questions today. The first is how, how are animals cloned? You've probably all heard of cloning animals, and so we'll talk about how that actually works. Um, what the potential and actual uses of cloning are. Um, what are the prospects for doing this with humans as opposed to other animals? Um, and, and also what's being done in the way of gene therapy in humans. And the final question is one I've been asking you to sort of think about throughout the course as your knowledge of how genes work uh, keeps on growing. Um, and that is how much of who we are is in our genes. That is, uh, you know, what do genes tell us about um, the kinds of things we're interested in? about um, in people, like personality, behavior, um, height, weight, all these other traits. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, how animals are cloned. And there's this article that's one of your required reading articles that goes through it uh, pretty well. And so this is a figure from that article. And um, I'm going to go through just sort of this overview, and then we'll sort of zoom in on particular features of it. So the basic idea is that the way you clone something is you have a donor and a recipient. So the donor is the thing you want to clone. And the recipient um, is uh, usually an egg cell that's been, um, that's had its, all of its genetic material removed. Okay? And so uh, what you see here is an egg. Okay, so above is schematic views. And below is actual views of cells and needles and things. Um, so what you start out with is, in, is an egg. Okay? And this is what an egg looks like. It has the egg surrounded by this protective layer called the zona pellucida. And the chromosomes are here. And there's this other thing called the polar body, which we don't have to get into what it actually is. But basically, that contains chromosomes too. So um, the idea is that in order to clone something else, you have to start with an egg that doesn't have any of its own chromosomes. So the first step in cloning is to take a needle, puncture the egg, and draw out the polar body and the chromosomes. Okay? Um, and then what you're left with is just an egg that um, has everything except chromosomes. Um, and so you can see this is a picture of, the, of an actual needle going into a cell. Um, it's hard to see. I'll show you a better pi picture in a second. Um, and then the chromosomes are drawn out, and then the needle's taken out. And what you're left with is an egg cell that doesn't look much different from the one you started with. Um, but it is different because it doesn't have its chromosomes anymore. So that's, that's the recipient. That's what you're going to put new chromosomes into, because the way you clone an animal is you take uh, genetic material from that animal, and you put it into a cell like this, and then get this cell to grow and form a new animal. So in this example, the donor, the thing you're trying to clone, um, has uh, produced some skin cells. Okay, So that's what's diagrammed here and shown here. So skin cells look very different under a microscope than egg cells. They have this sort of elongate, angular um, appearance to them. And so what you can do um, is, these are just blow-ups of what I just went through, by the way, So just so you can see a little bit better egg, needle goes in, you draw out the chromosomes, you're left with an egg without any chromosomes, and then you go to your skin cells and get new chromosomes. Okay? And so uh, basically what you can do is actually inject an entire skin cell into this egg. Eggs are big. Okay? So you can actually fit an entire skin cell you know, in just part of the egg. And that's easier than trying to get the nucleus, where all the chromosomes are, out of that skin cell. So you take another needle, and you get your skin cell in the needle, and then you go back in and you puncture the, uh, the zona pellucida and into the space in between the egg and the zona pellucida, you inject an entire skin cell. Okay, so now you have this egg without, without chromosomes with an entire skin cell sort of sitting around its outside, inside this outer protective layer. Okay? And you can sort of see that here. Then what you do is... Um, this sort of magical thing, which is you zap it with electricity. Okay, that's what these yellow lightning bo bolts are meant to represent. And what happens is then the skin cell's membrane, the cell membrane outside the cell, fuses with the egg cell's membrane, and that allows everything from the skin cell to enter the egg. 
okay? It's very similar to what you did in lab when you heat shocked your cells to get them to take up DNA. So heat shock and electrical shock, they do the same thing. They get cell membranes to become more porous and to open up so that things can go into them. So in this case, um, it actually fuses, the egg cell membrane fuses with the skin cell. And then what's shown here is this sort of skin cell merging with the egg cell. So now you have this uh, composite thing that's your egg cell without any chromosomes and then the skin cell which does contain a nucleus. It contains chromosomes from those skin cells. Um, but again, if you just look at this cell, it doesn't look much different from what you started with. But it's, it's amazingly different because it now contains an entirely new set of chromosomes. Okay, and just the close-ups close of this to go through just quickly one more time. So you have your cell without chromosomes. You inject the needle with the skin cell. Uh, you leave the skin cell inside. And then you zap it with electricity. And magically, that causes the skin cell to fuse with the egg cell. And now you have this new cell that has all the chromosomes of that skin cell. Um, I want to show you this in a better image. This is actually a movie. Okay, so what you're going to see here is the first step, which is the needle entering the egg and taking out its chromosomes. Okay, and this takes some skill. Okay, this is not a sort of amateur job here, right? Um, you have this egg cell, and this over here um, is basically a, a suction. So there's a, a vacuum here, and that keeps the egg cell in place. It basically keeps it attached so it doesn't move around, so that when you jab it with the needle, it doesn't go shooting off in some other direction. Okay. The needle is going to come in, and it's going to take out the nucleus of this cell. Okay, and as I said, it takes some skill because probably looking at this, you can't tell where the nucleus is. Right, so it takes an expert to be able to do it. Now watch this movie, and you'll be amazed at how quick this happens. All right. So there's the nucleus right there, and a little bit of cytoplasm from inside. Did everyone catch that? Do you want me to play it again? Let me play it again. Okay. So you sort of line it up, and then you go right in, grab that nucleus, and come right back out. And so this egg cell is sort of what you started with, right? except now it doesn't have any chromosomes. But it's perfectly healthy. You know, that, that operation of jabbing it, taking out the nucleus, and removing the needle, you can see that the cell membrane sealed itself up perfectly well, so it's perfectly fine. They're invisible, right? So this right here is actually the nucleus, or it might be the polar body. Um, so as I said, it takes some skill to be able to look through the microscope and see where you're supposed to go and draw it out. Yeah, yeah. OK. And then the next step of the procedure is to take your skin cell and inject it into the egg that doesn't have any chromosomes anymore. So what you're going to see in this movie is the needle approaching, puncturing the zona pellucida, and then the skin cell is going to come down the needle and enter the egg. See the needle in between the zona pellucida and the egg cell. The skin cell comes down the needle, and it's sort of deposited actually over the egg cell. So it's still in between the egg cell and the zona pellucida, which would be here. Okay? Um, and so now the skin cell is inside the egg cell. And then uh, the next step would be shock that with electricity, and that causes those two cells to fuse. And then that cell can potentially grow up and become a whole new organism. Okay? And its genetic material is all from that skin cell. So th there are really only these two, two steps in the procedure. Take the chromosomes out, put new chromosomes in. But it's not as easy as that. Um, because it, um, as you probably know, it was only fairly recently that the first animal clones were made. Um, and the reason it's difficult is because um, skin cell DNA is actually different from egg cell DNA. So throughout the course, I've been telling you over and over again that 
the cells in your hand, the cells in your lung, the cells in your heart, the cells you know, on your kneecap, they, they all have the same exact DNA. Right? I've been telling you this over and over again. Um, so that was sort of a lie. All right? I'm fessing up here. That was sort of a lie. Okay? It's the same DNA in that it has the same DNA sequence. It has the same letters. Okay? But the DNA is different. Um, and the way it's different is that as development proceeds from an embryo to this differentiated adult, the DNA has changes that happen to it. And in particular, some chem chemical modifications of the DNA that don't change the string of letters, but change the DNA happen. And those make it more or less likely that the gene is actually going to be transcribed. So what happens, for example, is in some cells in your body, some genes are basically permanently turned off. They can never be turned on. Um, and that's because those cells don't use those genes. And as a fail-safe mechanism, the body has, through its development, made sure that those genes are targeted with particular chemical modifications so that those genes are not activated. Okay? And so that means that even though the, D the string of letters is the same in this cell and in a cell in my heart, the DNA is actually different chemically. And so that's what makes it challenging to take a cell from any particular part of the body, say a skin cell, and clone it. Because what you're asking it to do is to reactivate a lot of genes that it has permanently shut off. OK, does that make sense? All right. And so one way to think about that is what happens during development. OK, so if we just look at what happens to cells during development, you start out as a fertilized egg. So sperm and egg meet, and you get a fertilized egg. And then that cell divides, and then those cells divide, and then those cells divide. So very quickly, you get lots and lots of cells through all of these cell division events. Okay? But it's not just that the cells are, are dividing. They're also taking on identities. Okay? So some of these cells will form a lineage of cells that becomes the heart, for example. And other cells will form a lineage of cells, lineage of cells that contributes to the brain. And other cells will contribute to, to the skin and to the bone marrow and to your eyes and all the other tissues in your body. And so through the course of these cell divisions, the, the cells are actually becoming different because they're activating different genes. And then those genes activate different genes. And so you have these different developmental programs playing out in different tissues in your body as they develop. And as I said, what happens through that process of differentiation is some genes are sort of stuck in the on position, and some genes, a lot of genes, are actually stuck in the off position. Okay? So by the time you get a differentiated cell at the end of this developmental process, which goes on for many more cell divisions, um, that cell can't necessarily be coaxed to behave as if it was a fertilized egg. Because a fertilized egg, if you think about it, is capable of producing every cell type in your body. Right? It has to, because you, st you all start out as a single cell. Right? Um, these are the, the technical jargon word we use in the field is totipotent. It's potent to become everything, total. Um, as cell division and differentiation proceed, cells lose their potency. They lose their ability to take on certain fates. So once you pass a certain point, then a certain cell type might become muscle, or it might become something else, but it won't become a nerve cell in your brain. It just doesn't have that path open to it anymore because of the changes in gene expression that have happened um, through the course of differentiation. So that's what makes taking an adult cell, sort of at the end of this differentiation process, taking out its chromosomes and putting it back into an egg difficult. Because our expectation is actually that it won't work. You won't be able to take an adult cell's chromosomes, put them into an egg, and get that egg to grow again. Okay? So it took a lot of trickery, a lot of sort of know-how and some luck, and a lot of trial and error to actually get this process to work where you can take an adult cell and do it. And as you probably know, the first time this was done um, was uh, almost 15 years ago now. And it was done with a sheep named Dolly. Okay? So basically, Dolly is a sheep, right? Um, and she was, she was cloned. Uh, and the adult cell that she was cloned from was actually a mammary cell from an adult ewe, an adult female sheep. Okay? So the same is true of those mammary cells as of skin cells. They don't automatically revert to being totipotent. Okay? 
And so um, the group that was led by Ian Wilmot at the Roslyn Institute in producing Dolly, they had to figure out the conditions that would basically erase all of those changes to the DNA that had happened from the course of developing from a fertilized egg to a mammary cell. So that that DNA was basically as if it came from a um, embryonic cell, from a, from a fertilized egg. Because it's much easier to just take two egg cells and swap their chromosomes. Okay, that's not particularly challenging. What's challenging is getting an adult cell and cloning that. And you can see what, you'll see some examples throughout today's lecture of why you would want to get an adult cell, why it's important that you're able to do it with an adult cell. Okay? So uh, Dolly was the first uh, animal clone that was made, uh, but then she was soon followed by basically a zoo of other cloned animals. Okay, so this is a, a pictorial list of the other animals that have been cloned, uh, some of which you probably have never heard of, right? So, uh, wolves have been cloned, cats, dog, sheep, mule, cat, buffalo, mouse, goat, rabbit, horse, cow, pig, rat, ferret, okay? Um, it gets a little ridiculous after a while, right? Why would someone need to clone a ferret if they've already cloned a rat? Um, there are a couple on here you probably have never heard, on, heard of. Anyone heard of that before, a mouflon? Okay, it's basically a wild sheep. You can tell it's a sheep, right? Um, or a gar. Anyone heard of this one before? Okay. Um, as you'll see, this is a, a rare kind of <coughs> ox that's found in Asia. Okay. Um, and so the reason these guys were cloned is it was thought to be an example of maybe um, a use of cloning to rescue endangered species. So gars are rare cows, basically. They're oxen um, that are native to South Asia. Right? They're, they're not a, a, a species that's doing well. Okay? Uh, and the idea was that uh, maybe one way of producing more of them to sort of rescue the species would be by cloning. Okay? And so uh, a GAR clone was made um, by this process of nuclear transfer, taking a, a cell and putting it into an, an egg that did not have uh, any chromosomes left. Okay? And in this case, the recipient egg was a cow's egg. Okay, just a normal cow, right? So uh, gars and cows are close enough related that the egg is pretty much the same, okay? And it's just the DNA that you're putting in that's different. And this is important because obviously if you're trying to rescue something endangered, um, you're doing it because maybe you don't have breeding individuals that you can use. And so if you, it was easy enough to get uh, gar eggs, then you wouldn't really have a problem, right? But it w it's not easy to get gar eggs. So instead, what you do is you get cow eggs, and you try taking the same, you know, this, this gar has, you know, a lot, a lot of skin cells, for example. So you have lots of chromosomes that you could potentially insert into cow eggs and get more gars. So Noah was the first uh, gar cloned. Um, and it didn't go so well. So he was born. And uh, they took a picture of him. And he died two days later of, of an infectious disease, of dysentery. Um, it's not clear whether the disease had anything to do with the fact that he was a clone. But it could, right? Because I, I mean, the whole idea of this process is that you're trying to return these adult cell chromosomes to a state as if they're the same as an embryo, as a fertilized egg. But that doesn't necessarily work 100%. And so for example, if uh, immune system related genes are not activated properly in a clone, then you can get a, a clone, um, a baby gar like this, that can't fight disease very well and would die. Um, so it, it, it's hard to tell whether that's the reason or, or, um, or whether it was just bad luck. So pe people have actually proposed that this could be used uh, if uh, these kind of kinks are worked out to, to clone endangered species. Okay, and so this article you know, gives you some cute examples of, of those endangered species. Um, but it seems to me, at least, that it's a fairly inefficient way to deal with the endangered species problem, right? Because cloning is a big endeavor. Um, you basically do one at a time, right? Um, and so you have to be pretty desperate in order to resort to this as a way of actually saving a species. Um, protecting habitat and things like that might be a better way to go, at least first. The idea can be extended if you can, if you can 
sort of clone a living endangered species, well, what about cloning a species that used to exist but doesn't exist anymore? Okay, and this is where we sort of enter the realm of science fiction. Um, but at least some of it seems pretty plausible. So, um, for example, as I told you in a previous lecture, it's now possible to sequence DNA from ancient bones. Okay? Um, or at least from, in the case of a woolly, woolly mammoth, tissue that's been frozen in permafrost for a long time. Okay? And so we now have the complete genome sequence of a woolly mammoth. Okay? These guys no longer exist. Um, we now have a genome sequ sequence of a Neanderthal. Okay? They no longer exist, but we have their DNA. And so if it were possible to sort of reconstruct the chromosomes, because the sequence comes in lots of little chunks, right? But if it were somehow possible to sort of plug that sequence into a machine and then spit out chromosomes at the other end of the machine, then you would get chromosomes. And then you could say, in this case, collect elephant eggs and inject them with woolly mammoth chromosomes. In this case, you could, in principle, collect human eggs and inject them with um, Neanderthal chromosomes. Um, and so, in principle, at least, it would be possible to clone a woolly mammoth or a Neanderthal. Now, we couldn't do that tomorrow, right? Because we don't have the chromosomes of a woolly mammoth or the chromosomes of a Neanderthal. Um, it wouldn't necessarily work at all because maybe woolly mammoths are different enough from elephants that the egg would not be compatible with the chromosomes. Maybe Neanderthals are different enough from us that our eggs would not be compatible with their chromosomes for one reason or another. But at least in principle, you can think about doing that experiment if you had enough resources. Um, which, of course, leads everyone to think, well, maybe we could do a Jurassic Park style thing, right? And so we can get dinosaur DNA um, and make dinosaur chromosomes and then inject them into some kind of reptile eggs and then get dinosaurs again. So this, of course, would be a little bit more challenging than the mammoth. I'd say this is sort of the order of how challenging this task would actually be. So um, I'd put my bets on a woolly mammoth being cloned before either of these. Okay, This one, don't hold your breath for, because besides the technical problems, there would also be serious ethical concerns about cloning in the other call. Right? Um, this one is a lot more difficult technically because dinosaurs last lived many millions of years ago, whereas the woolly mammoth is only 10,000 years ago. We have frozen samples, so we basically have good intact DNA. There's not a lot of good intact DNA from dinosaurs. Um, anyone remember where the DNA came from in Jurassic Park for the dinosaurs? <coughs> hmm? Yeah, from, from insects in amber, right? So the insect bit the dinosaur, dinosaur and then got covered in sap and was sort of frozen in time. And then you go in and you, you get the DNA out of the gut of the mosquito or something like that. Um, and you get the dinosaur DNA. So um, as far as I know, that's not been actually done. I, I don't know of any case where someone's taken an insect from amber and gotten di dino DNA out of it. Um, but what has been done recently is it's actually been discovered that even though these fossilized dinosaurs are tens of millions of years old, so many specimens are over a, 100 million years old. Um, some of them still have soft tissue inside of them. And this was a big and controversial surprise from a few years ago. And so people have actually been able to isolate proteins from dinosaur bones and use modern technologies to actually sequence the proteins, so to find what the amino acid sequence of proteins is. So far, they haven't gotten DNA out in the same way, but at least it's possible. You know, it might happen someday. It will be fragmented DNA because it's so old, it's had many, many years to break down and so on. But at least possibly at some point in time, not anytime soon, but at some point in time, uh, there will be a big report of the first dinosaur genome, the same way this might have surprised us if we were contemplating it 10 years ago, or this might have surprised us if we were contemplating it 10 years ago. Um, again, I wouldn't necessarily bet on it happening anytime soon, but it's not out of the question. So. Right, so these are all sort of potential uses of cloning. Um, there are some other uses of cloning that, that don't have to do with sort of rescuing animals from oblivion, but are sort of uh, seen as more medical, practical reasons to do cloning. Okay? And so one of those is actually to make medicine. The idea being that maybe you can engineer a sheep or a cow or a goat 
um, to produce certain proteins in its milk, and then you can drink a glass of milk and get your shot of whatever, whatever medicine uh, you might need. Um, or that milk can be purified in large quantities to get those proteins out because um, in certain cases, the proteins that are used for certain treatments are very complicated proteins. They have to be processed properly inside of mammalian cells in order to work. And so you, don't, you can't just sort of manufacture those proteins in bacteria the way you can some proteins. Um, so the way this would work is you would basically go through the cloning procedure with one extra step. And the extra step is that when you get the chromosomes, before you inject those into the recipient uh, cell, you first modify them. You do genetic engineering on those chromosomes to change their DNA sequence to something that is presumably beneficial to, to whoever is doing that experiment. So in this case, what's, what's shown is um, cloning from embryonic cells, okay, which is a lot easier, as I said, than cloning from skin cells. Okay? And so the idea is that, or any type of adult cell, so you, you take an embryo from a sheep, okay? um, you get the cells, and you can actually culture those cells in a dish. Embryonic cells can actually be cultured in a dish. Skin, skin cells can be cultured in a dish. Some other cells can be cultured, too. Um, and so you grow those cells up in culture so you can get a lot of basically embryonic sheep cells okay, before they've differentiated. These are cells that don't have a tissue identity yet. They're, they're still totipotent or almost totipotent. And then in the end, so I'm going to show you the other part of this figure in a second, but in the end, you're going to take do the same thing. You're going to remove chromosomes from an egg cell from a sheep. Okay, so here's the... Uh, the recipient egg coming from another adult sheep. Okay, you're going to take the chromosomes out, and what's next is what happens in the middle. Okay, and what happens in the middle is that. Um, is there another one? Yeah, let me show you this one first. Okay, um, you take the DNA from the sheep. Okay, and you engineer it. So what's shown here is sort of a splicing type reaction where you've cut the DNA and you're going to insert a new piece of DNA. And in this case, what's, what's inserted is the DNA sequence of a human gene into that sheep. Okay, so you're basically crossing the species barrier and you're making part of that sheep's DNA human. Okay? And particularly the example shown here in this article is that um, you're taking a human sequence uh, that encodes a protein that's required in your blood. So let's say it's a clotting factor, okay, that's required for your blood to clot, and, and there are hemophiliacs who don't have enough of that clotting factor, and so this would be a way of producing more of it. It's basically because they're, they're much, much earlier in this differentiation process, okay, so they don't have genes that have been permanently turned off or turned on yet. So they basically behave like that fertilized egg. And it's easier to grow up a whole animal again just from their DNA. OK, so you splice this human gene into the chromosome of the sheep. Um, and then you, um, let's see, which slide do I want to go to next? It's hard when these figures take up more than one slide. Um, yeah, so then you have this new DNA that's mostly sheep DNA, but has the human DNA in it. OK. Um, and part of the DNA that you're adding here is the human gene, but part of it has a selectable marker, which we've talked about before, right? So some way of knowing that that DNA is in there. In this case, it's an antibiotic resistance gene, neomycin, okay? And so you take, the, so you take that DNA, you add it to cultured cells, and then you um, grow them in the presence of this drug so that you know you now have chromosomes that contain this human DNA, okay? Um, but these cells now are just growing in a dish. Those cells are not forming a new sheep embryo. They're not going to be um, growing up into a sheep. They're just a convenient source of cells to make sure you have the right chromosomes now. Okay? And so it's those cells that actually now act as the skin cells acted in that first procedure. Those cells are going to be injected into these, uh, mother, these new egg cells without nuclei. Okay? So that's what's happening here. right? So this is the second step in the procedure. This egg has already had 
uh, its uh, chromosomes removed. And now what you're injecting here is one of these cultured uh, cells, embryonic cells, that has these modified chromosomes. Okay? So it's exactly the same as the, the cloning procedure I showed you originally with that extra step in between where you've re-engineered these chromosomes. Okay? So then you do this electric shock thing to get the cells to fuse, and then the, these, the egg cell can start developing, um, and you get a new embryo, and then you, that embryo starts out in a dish, right? So you have to take that embryo and implant it into a surrogate mother. Okay? And then that surrogate mother carries the embryo to term, and then you get a sheep out in the end. Um, and that sheep, if all goes according to plan, now has a human gene in it. Okay? And that human gene is producing some blood protein. Okay? And so this is not make-believe. Right? This, this is actually done now. So um, this is another cloned sheep. Uh, that's Polly. Okay? And Polly's surrogate mother. Right? And um, in this case, it wasn't like Dolly. It wasn't just take a mammary cell, stick it in an egg, and you get a clone. There was that step in between where Polly's genes were actually modified. And in particular, a blood clotting protein encoding gene was inserted into her chromosomes. So you have sheep chromosomes with a human gene encoding factor nine, which is a protein that's required for your blood to clot. And, and people with hemophilia sometimes lack that protein. And so um, they need that protein supplemented into their blood in order to be able to, uh, to heal from wounding. Okay? And so now what you have is Polly grows up, and she starts producing milk. And that milk contains factor nine. And so this, see, this is seen as a, as a potential um, sort of advance in the production of, of drugs like this, particularly drugs that are basically human proteins. Um, and so a couple of years ago, it was announced that uh, Argentina, remember from last lecture, Argentina is heavy into genetic engineering, right? So Argentina now has um, cows that are cloned with the human insulin gene, OK? So the idea is that diabetics would somehow have a new source of insulin that's not coming from the normal ways of getting insulin, um, but is actually coming from the milk of these cows. Right? And the, the company that's doing this projects that it'll be a lot cheaper to do it this way, actually, because making functional human insulin in other ways um, is kind of expensive. It's complicated. And so they think that because a mammal is actually producing it instead of, say, a bacterium, um, the insulin uh, will be basically a, equivalent to human insulin, and all you have to do is then purify that insulin out of the milk, um, and, and basically it's injectable. Okay? I'm not sure I'd buy stock in this company, but that's, that's basically the idea. So the fact that all this cloning can go on right, sort of leads to the inevitable uses of cloning by people who have too much free time or too much money. Okay. And so um, this is another story from a couple of years ago of a cloned, uh, cloned bull in this case. So um, the story goes that there's this prize-winning, amazing bull that this rancher in, uh, in Spain has. And he, you know, to him, this bull is the equivalent of uh, you know, Rubens or Velazquez painting. This is just such a wonderful. Uh, wonderful bull, a creature that you, you, you want to just preserve forever so everyone can appreciate it. right? But of course, bulls don't live forever. And so the guy's idea was, well, if I can clone the bull, right? if I can get cells from the bull and make more genetically identical copies of this bull, um, then basically you could have this bull uh, in perpetuity. right? You just always have that bull around. Uh, people are now doing this with dogs. OK, so these are actually two clones created from the same donor. Um, so what's interesting in this case is that um, the dog that is the donor here is actually dead at the time of cloning. So um, back in 2002, the owner of that dog decided to preserve some of the tissue of that dog in case it ever became possible to clone it. Okay. Um, and again, the reason for wanting to do that is that this dog was just the best dog ever. Okay? Uh, this is how the guy describes his dog. She was an amazing dog, superior intellect, incredibly beautiful, 
obedient, a phenomenal temperament. I especially loved her majestic plume of a tail. Okay, so this is a guy who was really attached to his dog. Um, and so he had this frozen preserved tissue of that dog, and when that dog died, uh, he still had that tissue. And then it became possible to do this kind of cloning with dogs. And so the same thing, you take this, the chromosomes, you, know, you take, say, a, a cell from that preserved tissue, and you insert it into another dog egg, um, and you can get a clone. And in this case, they did it twice. So these are both clones of that original dog. So our terminology starts to get confusing now, right? Because are these identical twins? Are they sisters? Are they daughters? You know, what are they in relation to that original dog? Okay, they're basically, um, I think the most accurate way to describe them, except as clones, is that they're identical twins removed in time from that original dog. Okay, it's as if that original dog had had twins, um, but they waited a few years to actually develop. So this article um, is one you, can, you should read. Um, it's on your reading list. Um, and you can read about not only the similarities between these dogs and the original dog, but also the differences. Okay? So you can see their coat color is not identical. So that's interesting. You know, and it, we can consider this, in a sense, um, an experiment into how much genes control the outcome here. Right? Because these two dogs have identical genes, and they have identical genes to the donor. Right? But they don't look identical. Okay? There are differences in, in coloration, you know, smaller or bigger patches of coloration here or there. They, you know, they're not exactly the same. The same way my identical twin and I don't look exactly the same, even though we have the same genes. Okay. Um, the article also talks about some of the behaviors that are different between these dogs and each other and these dogs and the original dog. Okay. So that's another interesting type of experiment, right? How much of the behavior is reproduced? How much of that behavior came about uh, through the course of training the original dog or other sort of chance events during that dog's lifetime as opposed to our being genetically programmed? Okay. And there are some differences. You mean leading to like different coloration patterns? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, the, the, the assumption we have to make or the conclusion we draw is that when there are differences, say, between a big patch or a little patch of coloration, that the difference there somehow goes to differences in gene activity. Because there are genes that control pigment production, right? Um, and so if there's more or less pigment production, ultimately, that's caused by differences in the activities of genes even though the sequences of the genes are exactly the same. OK, another potential use of cloning is for what I've talked about before, which is germline gene therapy. And if you think about it, germline gene therapy is basically the same as what I just described for the sheep that was made to have human protein made, up, made in it. Okay, Because basically, you go through the same steps. You get chromosomes, and in this case, you would get chromosomes from, say, an egg um, that is mutant in some way. The, 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 there's some mutant gene there, right? So uh, say the one of the parents is a carrier for a particular genetic disease, um, and you want to make sure that whatever baby those parents have um, doesn't have that disease. Okay, so one way to do that, at least in principle, right, is that you get the chromosomes. You say, "Oh, bad luck. There's the there's the bad gene, but let's fix the gene, and then let's reinsert those chromosomes into an egg, grow grow up um, that egg in a culture dish, um, implant the embryo back into a human female, into a woman, and then have a baby." Okay, so um, in principle, all of the steps are the same as what I described for a sheep. And, and what's shown here is that you have these embryonic cells in a dish. Okay? Um, you add this way of fixing or replacing or supplementing some bad disease gene. Okay? You have some marker for when that happens. So you have red cells instead of yellow cells. Um, you can select 
the engineered cells in some way. And then you let those, those cells develop into uh, an embryo by injecting them into an egg without chromosomes, doing the electric shock, and then they fuse and start developing, and then ultimately you get a baby. Okay, so that's not done yet. There's no, there's, as far as I know, there are no cases of, of this uh, being done yet. Um, but something similar is actually being done in the sense of using genetic technologies to select which embryo actually develops. Okay, the idea being that once you get to this stage, all you really have are some cells that have good chromosomes and some cells that have bad chromosomes. Okay? And so the idea is that if you have some way of telling those apart and making sure that the good chromosome ones develop, um, then you'll get a baby that, that doesn't have a particular disease. So I want to play you a movie from the New York Times about this process. So not the process of fixing genes, but the process of selecting embryos. And this is called uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So, do you want to go on your side? Yeah. Okay, come on. <laughs> Chloe Kingsbury is a perfectly healthy two-year-old child with two adoring parents. Do you want your shoes? No. Okay. Chloe lives with her mother, Colby, and her father, Chad, in a modest suburban home outside of Chicago. Like most new parents, Colby and Chad wanted their child to be brought into this world with all the hope and promise that other children have. But there was one problem. In my family, there, there is a cancer gene that has devastated our family. It's, it's killed my mother, uh, my two uncles, my grandmother's lost all three of her children. I have two cousins that have been affected um, already with, with different forms of cancer. The gene Chad is talking about can lead to a form of colon cancer that can affect the person carrying it in midlife usually around 45. He tested positive for the gene and learned that, according to the laws of genetics, there was a 50% chance the gene would be passed on to his children. Many people with the gene never get cancer at all, and if the cancer is caught and treated early, there is a nearly 90% survival rate. Still, that level of risk proved too high given the alternatives available. No matter how remote the possibility is, it's still a possibility that she could get cancer why burden her with that if we don't have to? From a relative, the couple learned about a medical procedure that is becoming increasingly common, whereby aspiring parents undergo in vitro fertilization and select only those embryos that are lacking in certain potentially harmful genes. The procedure is known as PGD. PGD stands for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Dr. Kenneth Offit is Chief of Clinical Genetics at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And what PGD does is to take an embryo at the eight cell stage very early, to take one of those cells out, test it for a genetic mutation. If the embryo does not have that mutation, that gets implanted and goes on to become a fetus. But for many couples like the Kingsburys who decide to go ahead with PGD, the decision isn't easy. My wife and I did a lot of reading, a lot of research. We talked about this for two months because it's, it's a very difficult decision to make. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we, having a healthy child kind of outweighed everything. Part of the difficulty, says the couple, was bringing others on board to accept the idea of meddling with nature. That meant overcoming some religious concerns from Mr. Kingsbury's family and convincing friends that what they were going to do was not something out of science fiction trying to explain this process to them that we ourselves didn't fully understand um, just sounded like you know some type of space age movie and they just thought why you know why are you doing this the procedure required that mrs. Kingsbury undergo frequent hormone injections and a painful egg extraction process it all seemed very complicated at first you know there was just a lot of shots a lot of medicine a lot of procedures involved and to pay for the procedure the couple also had to dig more than ten thousand dollars out of their savings a fact that weighs heavily on the doctors who are part of this revolution. One of the issues that has struck me from the outset here is that we need to be fair. We have to be equitable in the distribution of these technologies. If we decide that we're going to go ahead, for example, then everyone should have access. Right now, to do PGD, it can be ten to $15,000, and the insurance coverage for this is very variable. They may cover it if there's an infertile couple, but generally will not for these kinds of elective decisions that we're talking about. PGD has been around since the early 1990s, but as awareness of the procedure has spread, more people than ever before are making this choice. 
Dr. Offit suggests that part of PGD's allure has to do with a desire among couples to manage their own destinies rather than let nature take its course. Over the last several years, I have become increasingly sensitive to the fact that many of these young people do feel a sense of empowerment, of taking control, when they realize that they can, if they choose, have children who are guaranteed not to carry these mutations that they have carried, that their parents, their grandparents, and on back many generations. Testing for our children was the one actual active thing we could do. You know, up, up until then, we were just watching. We were just watching cancer take his family over. About 1 in 200 Americans carry a genetic mutation that makes them more susceptible to breast or colon cancer, the two common hereditary cancers for which there are now genetic tests. But as scientists learn more about the genetics of cancer and other inherited traits, the dilemmas become more complex. The other, the other ethical challenge and question that has been brought up is referred to as the slippery slope. If we're going to make it possible to select for certain genetic traits, who decides? But I do recognize that as we come to better understanding of other polygenic disorders, um, you know, such as you know, obesity and other traits, then it will become murkier. And I think that is a focus that will require a, a, a very concerted uh, social uh, uh, discussion. That discussion is already taking place. But in the meantime, couples like the Kingsburys are pressing forward with their desires to have children free of the diseases that have burdened their families. The Kingsburys, in fact, are planning on having a second child. Now that Chloe's here, you know, everybody adores her. And, you know, like, a, we're, we're going to do it again. I mean, we want to have another child, and we're going to do it again. And everybody is, is fully on board this time. Okay, so in a little bit, we're going to talk about some of these slippy, slippery slope type traits that might eventually be um, subject to this kind of uh, pre-implantation diagnosis. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is you saw the figure that you know one in 200 people might be affected by one of the known cancer genes now. Um, as you know from you know sitting here, the number of diseases where we're associating genes with them is just increasing and increasing, and so. Um, it's very possible that we'll soon reach a day where anyone choosing to have a child um, will get, w could get this test and find that every single embryo is subject to something, right? You know, there are some things that might have a much larger probability of leading to a terrible disease like these genes associated with, these, with colon cancer or breast cancer, um, but there will be many other risks to weigh, and at a certain point, I think it might become, you know, overwhelming to try and decide, well, do I want the child with 20% increased risk of breast cancer, or do I want the one with 10% risk of heart disease? You know, um, so this is something to watch out for as more and more becomes n known genetically. It might seem that the more knowledge you have, the easier it becomes, but I think it might actually be the other way around. So we're going to get back to some of these slippery slope type traits, but uh, before we do, I want to talk about the other type of gene therapy, which is not germline ge gene therapy, but somatic gene therapy, and in protect particular, a version of that called therapeutic cloning, okay? So the idea being that you can treat a person's disease, an actual person um, who has a disease, by engineering their own cells and putting those cells back into that person, okay? So now this is not affecting eggs or sperm or anything like that, so it's not germline, it's not um, changing um, that person's chromosomes forever or that person's progeny's chromosomes. Um, but it is changing the chromosomes in a subset of cells in that person, okay? And so it works exactly the same as everything we've talked about already, okay? You start with a recipient um, egg that you take the chromosomes out of, um, and then you need to put in donor chromosomes somehow, um, but you somehow engineer those chromosomes before you put them in um, to, um, to have whatever beneficial gene you decide for that particular treatment. And then, again, these cells grow up. So you start with um, an egg cell, and that grows into an embryo. But remember, now you're treating, say, an adult, and so you don't want that embryo to become a human being, right? You just want some of those cells, okay? And this 
has raised various ethical issues too about sort of producing embryos for the purpose of treating an adult as opposed for the purpose of producing an embryo that grows up into a child. Um, but in any event, the idea is that you would um, collect cells from the embryo and then in a, in a culture dish, you would add appropriate signals to get those cells to develop into the kind of tissue you need. So let's say um, you're treating someone with uh, pancreatic disease, then you would treat the stem cells in an appropriate way by giving them the appropriate signals that mimic what happens to developing pancreatic cells when they're developing in an embryo. Um, and so you basically convince these cells that come from the embryo, which are totipotent, to become pancreatic cells. Or given another mix of treatments, you get nerve cells or blood cells or uh, heart muscle cells. Okay? So this all is sort of an active area of research right now. What do you have to do to get embryonic cells to develop into nerve cells? What do you have to do to get embryonic cells to develop into blood cells like this? And some is known, more and more is known every day about these things. And as you might expect, um, part of the secret of getting nerve cells versus pancreatic cells versus blood cells versus heart muscle cells is which transcription factor genes you activate in those cells. Because transcription factors are basically telling the cells you know, sort of what they are by activating certain genes. And so if you put it, if you activate the right transcription factors, you can basically mimic developing pancreatic cells or <laughs> developing nerve cells. So the most common way that this type of thing is used is with blood cell diseases. And the, and the main reason is a very practical one. It's very easy to get blood cells out of a person without harming that person, and it's very easy to get blood cells back into that person without harming them. Okay? It's much harder to do that with, say, their brain or their pancreas or their heart. Right? And so, um, for example, uh, this disease, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency disease, or SCID, um, is caused by a single mutation in a particular gene that encodes this enzyme, adenosine deaminase. Okay? And without that enzyme, white blood cells don't function properly. Okay, so your, your immune system doesn't function properly. Um, you can do this trickery of genetic engineering to repair that gene. So you get human chromosomes, you get a virus that carries the, um, the, the functioning version of the gene, and you get that virus to infect those cells, and then they insert that DNA into those cells, and now you have a functioning gene in those cells. Um, and then once you have those functioning cells, you can basically infuse those back into the bloodstream of a patient. Okay? So take the cells out, fix them, put them back in. Right? Um, you have to do this over and over again because white blood cells are actually produced from your blood marrow. They don't have a very long lifetime normally. So in order to keep your white blood cells functioning, if this is the way you're doing the treatment, you have to do this regularly over and over again because you're not repairing the, bo the bone marrow, which produces these cells. You're actually repairing the circulating cells. Okay? So this is the schematic of how this all works. Uh, you have a child. You take white blood cells. You um, infect those white blood cells with this virus that carries the human ADA gene that works. You get cells that have that DNA integrated into their chromosomes. Um, you culture them. And then you take those cultured cells and you inject them back into that individual, and you have to do that repeatedly. Um, this is not without risk. Um, so there's a famous case that's discussed in your, um, in your textbook um, of a different disease, which is uh, OTC deficiency, ornithine transcarbamylase, which is another enzyme. Um, normally, the treatment for that disease is really hard. Okay, it's a very strict diet plus a lot of medications. Um, and so um, a boy named Jesse Gelsinger was uh, a volunteer for a gene therapy trial at, at the University of Pennsylvania um, and died from a really severe immune reaction to that therapy. Okay, so the it's easy enough to sort of draw a schematic and say, oh, yeah, you just take the cells out, you fix them, and you put them back in. But there are complications that can potentially occur that are basically life-threatening, and in this case, did take his life. Okay? So um, somehow, the process of modifying these cells and putting them back in, um, the way they were put back in, um, 
cause to this really severe immune reaction and his death. And there have been other cases of attempts at gene therapy over the years that have led to similar types of reactions um, that people really haven't figured out how to avoid yet. Um, this was sort of a notorious case um, because it seemed like there was suppression of information. So it was later discovered that other volunteers had had similar problems, although they, weren't, they didn't die from them. They did have similar immune reactions. Um, and this wasn't made public to the other people who were volunteering for this trial. Um, and also, in the previous stage of the research, when they were still doing research in monkeys instead of humans to make sure it was safe, or supposed to be safe, um, there were monkeys that died from the treatment for this reason. And that was held from the people who were volunteering for the trial. So this is a famous case of, of sort of misconduct in science. Um, again, if you have friends at UPenn, you, know, you can tell them not only do they have a history of racism, but they also have this on their hands. Okay. But that said, there are some potentially really exciting uh, rewards of doing gene therapy right. Okay, so this is an example that isn't quite gene therapy, but shows you the kind of thing that might be possible. So a little while ago, there was a case reported where um, a patient with AIDS had a bone marrow transplant. Okay, and normally the way that works is. Um, you know, the patient either is so immunocompromised they don't have functioning bone marrow anymore, or you somehow um, do some kind of treatment to get rid of their bone marrow, and then you replace that with a, a bone marrow from another person, a donor. Um, in this case, what happened was um, the, the bone marrow that was donated was genetically different from the patient's bone marrow in a very important way. Um, and that led to this um, basically cure, in a sense, of AIDS that that patient had, okay, of HIV infection. And the reason is that there's a gene variant in humans that's, that's rare but, but exists in, in, you know, if you count all people in a significant number of humans, um, which makes their blood cells immune to HIV infection. And the reason is that the way HIV enters cells is through this receptor on the cell surface called CCR5, okay? And most people have this receptor, okay? But if you don't have that receptor, the virus basically can't enter. And there are people who basically don't have that receptor because they, ha they, they have a different version of this gene that, that doesn't produce the receptor. And they're healthy, right? Um, which is part of the mystery. You know, they're healthy. They, they're living, breathing human beings. Um, you can't tell by looking at them that they don't have this gene. But they basically don't contract HIV because there's no way for the HIV to enter their cells. So what happened in this bone marrow trans transplant was that the donor actually was of this genotype. Um, and so this AIDS patient's blood cells were then repopulated with cells of this genotype, um, making them uh, resistant to H HIV infection. And so you can imagine that instead of doing it this way, you could have a gene therapy where you had um, someone who had AIDS, you take their white blood cells, you engineer them not to make this receptor, and then you re-inject those um, into their bone marrow, and potentially you would be able to then uh, cure, cure AIDS, at least potentially, right? It's a big, big if that it would work all the time, but at least it's potential. In most cases, and this is a point I've made before and I want to just emphasize again, in most cases, the path from knowing the genetic cause of a disease to actually treating it well is very long and difficult, okay? So the, the prime example is cystic fibrosis, okay, which is a, an extremely horrible disease. Um, it's caused by a mutation in a single gene. It was the first human disease gene that was identified at the DNA sequence level, okay? And this was over 20 years ago, okay? Um, and still, today, there is no effective treatment of cystic fibrosis, and in particular, there's none based on the knowledge of that gene, okay? So this is a picture um, that was just published in Nature Magazine, because um, 20 years ago, when the gene for cystic fibrosis was discovered, 
it was published in Science Magazine, and there was a boy on the cover that had cystic fibrosis, okay, that was sort of their poster boy for cystic fibrosis, and, and this great discovery was published, and it was a great discovery, right, that the gene associated with, with it was finally identified, okay? So this is the same guy 20 years later, right, holding the magazine where he was the cover boy, right? And, and the point is that uh, the irony that despite this 20 years of knowledge and scientific research based on that knowledge, there's still no effective treatment for the disease he had back then. And that's true of many, many genetic diseases. You know, uh, there are plenty of diseases where the gene is known, but still we have nothing to do about it based on that knowledge. And it takes a lot of research and um, figuring out a lot of complications to try and um, get effective treatments. Okay. What I want to finish with today is um, what I've been calling these slippery slope traits. Okay. So cystic fibrosis, it's a disease. Single gene broken, you get the disease. Uh, skid, single gene broken, get the disease. Okay. Most of the human traits we care about, some of which we consider diseases, some of which we just consider sort of variation in the population, um, are the product of multiple genes acting in concert with multiple different environmental influences. And one of the things that was brought up in that clip about um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is, well, what if people start making decisions based on that kind of information. And it's not just whether you could have a child that's not at risk for cancer, but whether you could have a child that's more likely to be a dancer. Whether you could have a child who's more likely to be blonde and tall. Whether you could have a child who's more likely to like boys or like girls. Okay? And these are things where not only is there incomplete genetic information and potentially will never have a good genetic explanation for any of these things. Um, but they're, they're traits that, we, that are clearly not diseases, right? And so the question becomes, well, if this information is available in whatever form, should people be allowed to use it, okay? So I want to talk a little bit about, oops, sorry, um, about some of these more complex traits and how people are thinking about them. So this is uh, a clip, from, again, from the New York Times about uh, genes associated with obesity. You're a good girl. Jane Parada has struggled with obesity her entire adult life. I guess the first big weight gain was in high school, and then I lost it, and then I gained the last couple years of college, and then I lost it again, and then it just went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Even the most drastic diets, she I says, couldn't stop her. her from gaining weight. I gained weight on 800 calories. She resorted to surgery to lose 250 pounds. Last month, scientists announced the discovery of a genetic variant carried by more than 25 million Americans that significantly raises their risk for obesity. Some have called it the fat gene. Parada, a medical writer and contributor to the weight loss blog, The Skinny Daily Post, took the news as welcome confirmation. Come on, darling, you're such a good girl. It's not a lack of willpower. It's a multifactorial illness, and it deserves to be treated appropriately, and people deserve to be treated with respect. There is no test yet to find out for sure if you have a genetic profile that predisposes you to gain weight. But a flood of reports about how genes shape human traits that we tend to attribute to personal choices or how we were raised is giving some people a sense of scientifically sanctioned reprieve. The further one is from, the, from average, the harder it is to change. Geneticist Dr. Jeffrey Friedman studies obesity at New York's Rockefeller University. Some people find the fact that there's a genetic basis for obesity comforting because it takes the onus off them and says what I believe to be true, which is that there's a biological basis for obesity and it's not people's fault. Other people are, are less happy about it because their reaction is that because uh, there's a genetic basis, it might mean that there's less than they can do about it. In recent months, scientists have identified genes that they say influence whether someone is at extra risk of getting addicted to cigarettes or particularly vulnerable to anorexia. By suggesting a genetic basis for behavior previously thought to be the result of character flaws or perhaps a bad childhood, scientists say the discoveries could make for more tolerance of human differences. 
I think in a way knowing that there's a genetic basis in time will hopefully lead us to be more charitable uh, to the obese than we currently are. You know, we don't overtly stigmatize people who are short or very short or very tall, and we shouldn't stigmatize people who are very thin or very heavy. The rudeness of people is just not to be believed. You know, people will make uh, rude animal noises. I've had people actually say to me, I'm really surprised that you're so well spoken. I, I'm appalled, absolutely appalled. <laughs> And rather what we should do, I think, is encourage people who are overweight to lose if even a modest amount of weight and, and try to become more fit because that has a great health benefit, but not demand of them that they sort of revert to a normal weight because we know that's, that's not possible for most people. Bottom line, you still have to play the cards you're dealt, but this also means that it demonstrates very concretely that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work. For the New York Times, I'm Amy Harmon.